Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When you hear the term gospel, what comes into your mind? Well, one of the things that should come into your mind is power. A power to change. A power to transform not only yourself, but if you're faithful, when people see that change, they will want to experience that same deliverance from sin, that same joy that comes from knowing the living God. Well, we are in the midst of our study of Paul's epistle to the Galatians. We are in the middle of chapter 1. So with that said, take out your Bible and talk or look with me, if you would, to verse 13. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. Now, the gospel that we proclaim is, of course, focus upon Messiah Yeshua. But we need to see if we have received it, there's going to be a change. And that change, sometimes it's talked about as a testimony, sometimes a testimony with words, better yet, a testimony with deeds. And that's what Paul is going to share with us. Remember, he has been defending his call as an apostle, He's speaking about the authority of the gospel, the true gospel, and we see that effect of the gospel in his life. Look, if you would, to verse 13. He's writing to these churches in Galatia, and he says, For you have heard of what? Of my, my conduct, that is, my lifestyle, my behavior in the past in Judaism. And what does he say about that? He says, How I exceedingly passed up my contemporaries, those in, in my generation. So what he's talking about here, and he gets it right. You see, Paul is speaking, when he uses the term Judaism here, he's not talking about the Judaism of Scripture. He's not talking here about the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the faith that is rooted in the revelation about Sinai and the prophets and the apostles. He's talking about the Judaism that he embraced. And we're going to see that this Judaism that he embraced was, was rooted in the tradition of the elders, in the previous generations that wrote and taught certain things that were related to Scripture but not founded upon Scripture. And that's why he says, you know, you have heard of my previous life where he says, I utilized the Judaism of the, the sages, the elders. And what did he do? He surpassed everyone. You see, Judaism today is a religion that, that exalts its followers, meaning that you get more and more respect from the community, more and more honor, more and more pride from your ability to, to, to move up in that teaching. But what we need to understand is this. Moses, the one who received the Torah, the, the, the foundation of, of true Judaism, and what the rabbis would say, the foundation of their Judaism, but it's interesting. Moses was someone who was called a servant of God. Moses was someone who the scripture says was the most humble, he wasn't rooted in pride. The more he knew of God and the Word of God, the more he understood his inadequacy and how small he was compared to the living God. So Paul, look at it again, verse 13, he says, For you have heard of my, my behavior in the past in Judaism, that I extended far beyond what? far beyond many of his uh, contemporaries. Now, he's coming to that in a moment, but he says here of, of his previous life, how he exceedingly persecuted who? How he exceedingly persecuted the, the congregations of what? God. Now, this is an important truth. Why? Because he unites 
the congregations who are rooted in the gospel with being congregations of God. And he says how he was trying to destroy them. Verse 14. And he says also, he says how, and here's the point that I was alluding to, how he progressed in Judaism far beyond his contemporaries in his generation, that is, in my, my, my nation. He says, having been zealous, exceedingly zealous, how much so? Zealous for who? And here's the key for the traditions of my fathers. Now, that gets to the heart of what I want you to see, that Paul, prior to his call, we talked about it last week, Paul was on that that journey, that road to Damascus, where the risen Messiah appeared to him. And he writes about that in another epistle to the Philippians. And he says, when I came in contact with the risen Messiah, When I learned the outcome of the gospel, he says, all which was in the past, any glory, stature, pomp, and circumstance that he had received from the traditions of his fathers, and here, make this very clear, when he says the traditions of his fathers, he's not talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. He's talking about the previous generations, those sages, those elders who put together these traditions that he was very zealous for and how he surpassed uh, everyone else in his observance of. But what does he say? All of this he counted as rubbish to what? to the knowledge of knowing the risen Messiah. So move on to verse 15. He talks about a change. And my hope is that we have experienced that change and we haven't come to the end of that change, that that transformation is still going on. How do we talk talk about that? Sanctification. And what is the basis of this sanctification, this change that we move closer and closer into the purposes, the plans of God? Well, notice what he says in verse 15. But when it pleased God to to set me apart from my mother's womb. Now, he realized something. Messiah, when he spoke to him, he talked to him that he was a chosen vessel, that, that he was set apart from his mother's womb to do something. He says, in order that I might what? Well, he says that I was called according to, here it is once again, as I said, Paul doesn't go very far before he relates once more to the grace of Messiah, who says, who has called me by means of his grace and revealed to me, what? His son. So I want you to see, when we're talking about the grace of God, what's the first thing that he mentions? The revelation of his son. Now, last week we talked about how important that term revelation is. That is to say, unless God reveals it, you're not going to comprehend it. It is something God moves and he gives us the potential to respond. He enables, but that decision has to be made. It is an outcome of when we submit our free will to the plans of God. And when that happens, salvation is the outcome. So he says, look again, verse 16, to reveal his son in me in order that I might proclaim. It's that same word that we get the word evangelization. It's rooted in that same word for gospel. So he says that I might preach his gospel, the gospel of him. Now, it's awkward almost in English to to literally translate the, the Greek here. But the reason for that is to show us the inherent relationship, the inability to separate the gospel from Yeshua. These two are our one entity. When we think about Messiah, everything that he did during his first coming was for the purpose of the gospel. And when he comes again, he's going to bring the outcome of that gospel, which is what? The kingdom of God. So once again, he says, to reveal his son uh, to me in order that I might evangelize uh, through him, evangelize that gospel message that is focused on him, 
among the nations. He says when, when that came about, look at what he did, verse 16, middle of the verse. He says, immediately. He says, immediately he responded. He says, I did not uh, uh, confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were before me apostles, but I went into Arabia. Now, why is that mentioned? And understand that, that this word, all of Scripture, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. This verse that ties the gospel message to Arabia is very important. Paul says, I received a call and I went where? He went to the same place where the Torah was given. We need to understand, and we'll see this later on in the book of Galatians, when we talk about Mount Sinai, it's not in Egypt. Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Paul reveals that later on in this book of Galatians. So this term is mentioned here. Why? In order that we understand the relationship between the gospel and the Torah. They're not in conflict with one another, biblically speaking. Where there's a conflict, and this is going to be the heart of what we're going to begin talking about next week in chapter 2, is when we have an incorrect view of the Torah. When the view of the Torah is, it's another means of salvation. See, Paul is defending his, his apostleship against those who want to teach a different gospel that says the work of Messiah is not sufficient. It's good, but it's not sufficient. We also need to observe and keep the law in order to be saved. Now, when we have that wrong view, the Torah's a problem. But when we understand the right view of the Torah, and one of the right views of the Torah is this, that the Torah speaks about righteousness. We talk about it as a Torah of truth, a law of truth. And when I come in contact with the commandments of truth, that is what God wants me to do and what he wants not for me to do, I realize I'm a sinner. And therefore, the Torah becomes the jumping point it causes me to turn to Messiah. So we see a connection, a healthy connection, a proper, a scriptural connection between the Torah and the gospel. And then what does he say? Well, look again, that same, same verse, middle of verse 17. But he says, I went out to Arabia, and again I turned to what? Damascus. Now, why does he mention Damascus? Very simple. We need to understand that, that Rav Shul, when I say Rav, he was a rabbi. He was trained by Ramam Gamliel. And therefore, he understood much of, of Judaism, these views of the ancient sages. And the gospel is to take the lost person and, and bring him back. The gospel is a gospel of restoration. Damascus was known in the Jewish mind at that day as a large community of Jewish people who were where? In exile. So we find even Messiah once going into Lebanon. This is, of course, Syria, but going up into the north and speaking in Lebanon. Why? To tell of those in exile that gospel message. So what does Paul do? He goes to the source of Scripture that is Mount Sinai, the Torah, the foundation of the Word of God. And he wants us to see there's connection between the gospel and the Torah. Then he goes to, Mount, to Damascus, the place of, of Jewish exile, and to tell them that the gospel brings us out of exile. Those who are lost, it restores. It gives us the, the ability, by the grace of God, to be found, to be restored. So he mentions here Arabia and Damascus for those two reasons. Look, look on to verse 18. He says, and after three years. Three, the number of revealing something. After three years, he went up to Jerusalem to visit Kepha, that is Simon Peter. And he says he continued with him, that is probably better translated, that word epimeno, that he remained with him for 15 days. Verse 19, and he says, but other of the apostles I did not see. He said, except Yaakov, James, the brother of our Lord, the half-brother. Look, if you would, to verse 12, <coughs> verse 20, excuse me. Verse 20, 
he again speaks in a very emphatic way. He says, but which I write to you, that is what I write to you, behold before God. Now, what he's saying here is this, that he's taking this truth and what he's sharing, and it's as though he has laid it all before God. And he says, I am convinced what? He says, I am not lying. That is, there is no falseness in this message. What he's sharing about the person, the work of Messiah, it is founded on the truth of God. It is founded and presented before him, and there's no falsehood before it. Verse 21, he says, after I came, he says, into the region of Syria and Cilicia, two places. Now, after he what? After he went up to Peter, and the, premise, the, the purpose here is that he conferred with Peter. And Peter agreed, we're going to come to this later on in chapter 2, something very interesting about Peter and Paul. But, but when he came and conferred with him, he remained there for 15 days, obviously, they talked about truth. Paul shared about his salvation experience, what Messiah shared with him. And afterwards, he what? He continued to do the work of what? He names two places here outside of Israel. Every time a place is mentioned outside of Israel, it is in exile for the purpose of what? Restoration. Leading those who are lost back. And so he continues on that same purpose. Verse 22, he says, but uh, I was not known, I was foreign, unknown by, by the face to the congregations of Judea, the ones that were in Messiah. So what he's saying here is this. He, he unites something in a very, very interesting way. He talks about congregations. And that word that is used here can, can also be related to a synagogue. So Paul was saying he went into synagogues and also, we could say, churches. But here's the point. He says, among those who were followers of Messiah, that is the congregation of redeemed, for a lack of a better word, the church, he wasn't known. But he doesn't say that about those of traditional Judaism. Paul had a very well-known reputation. He was also known, not by the face, but what does he say? He says, rather, look at verse 23. He says, but rather the ones there, that is in the congregations of, of Messiah, he says, they were the ones who had heard something. And here's what I want to emphasize, this change. They heard about a change that had happened, that the one who was persecuting them now was evangelizing in, and here's the second time we see something very unique. Up until now, whenever he talks about the gospel, the term grace appears. Now there's a change. He's speaking about the gospel, but now the second time, what does he add to it? He adds the term faith. Now, why is that so important? Well, the reason for this is the inherent relationship between that word faith and truth from a biblical perspective. When he speaks about the gospel, it's rooted in truth. When it says faith here, it's the truth that we need to respond to. It's the truth that we need to accept, the truth that we need to take hold of in our life. And what I want you to see is this, that it's only when we embrace this truth, then and only then is this transformation, this change is going to take part in our life. When we look at the second half of chapter 1, that's what Paul's talking about. He says, not only is my gospel documented by truth, but it's also manifested in my own life, the change that has happened, and what a radical change. These people in those congregations of Messiah, they did not know Paul by face, but they knew a reputation. They knew him as not some great Torah scholar, not some elite rabbi. And why do I say that? Because he was an elite rabbi. If he studied under Rabbi Gamliel, he was elite. They didn't know him in that way. They knew him as a persecutor of followers of Messiah. And what happens? The gospel. 
When that gospel message is revealed to him, what a transformation. And let me share with you, this was not a unique experience to Paul. Meaning, it's not that Paul was unique in the fact that he heard the gospel and things changed so dramatically. No, every person, every individual that truly hears and receives, they will be radically transformed. Their thoughts will be different. Their lifestyle will be different. Their their views will be different. Everything, little by little, but radically, will begin to change. And that's why, look again at this text, verse 22. He says, but, but I was unknown to them by face, that is to the congregations in Judea, those in Messiah. But rather, verse 23, but they were just hearing that the one who was persecuting them, persecuting literally us, now he evangelizes in the faith which was previously, he was what? Trying to destroy. Now, what a change from going to destroy something to now trying to build it up. Now, we have to ask ourselves because at the heart of this first chapter is Paul's call. And one of the things that that we see kind of very uh, subtly in the text is, well, Paul talks about, I have been called by God as an apostle, not by man, Not through some teaching, but through revelation. So why was it that Paul received this unique revelation? You see, revelation sometimes can come through a friend. They might simply share with you this message of the gospel about this one who was in the heavens, the Son of God, who entered into this word, took upon himself human flesh, died upon that cross, and three days later rose, showing the victory over sin. You might hear that simple message shared by a friend, shared by even a stranger, makes no difference. You might read it in a pamphlet, whatever. And God can use that simple terms for a heavenly revelation unto you. But what we see by Paul is something quite uh, elaborate. He didn't just hear about Messiah. Messiah appeared to him. Why? Well, Paul had something that God's looking for, and that is a commitment, a person who is willing to commit. And when we look at Paul, Paul was someone who was highly committed to what he calls in this chapter, the traditions of the elders, the fathers, the sages. Now, understand in Judaism, the term father can relate to a rabbi. We talk about a a rabbinical, for example, a study center. And, And the head rabbi there can be related to as a father. So when he says the traditions of the fathers, he's talking about rabbinical tradition. And Paul was totally committed to that. He had accepted it as truth. And anyone who was opposed to it, he was willing to see them put to death because they were opponents of what he thought was right. But when it pleased God, and here's the key, when it pleased God to reveal to him the gospel, that is the grace of Messiah Yeshua, and the outcome of that grace, Paul was totally transformed. He did a 180 degree turn from one who was persecuting to one what? One who was now trying to build it up. And that's this transformation that you should be experiencing in your life. Things that were important to you, you could care less about. Things that you put no emphasis in, no commitment to, now are the foundations of your life. How you live will be so changed that people can't help but see that there was a revelation from God in your life. And that's what Paul was speaking about here. Let's look at one more passage of Scripture. Notice what he says, last verse, verse 24. What was the outcome of this changed life? It says, and they were giving glory in me to God, meaning they were giving glory for what God had done in me. And that's the hope that each of us should have that God would be working in my life, in your life, in such a way that people would see that transformation, that change, and give glory to God. It's exactly what we see Messiah teaching on that Sermon on the Mount when he says that they might see your good works 
and give glory or praise to your heavenly Father. So let's make this real personal right now. If someone were to look at your life, and by the way, they are. No matter where you go, what you're doing, there's people paying attention to you. If you are a father or a mother, you know who's watching you closer than anyone else? Your children. And you, by your actions, not just your words, because actions speak louder than words, you are going to be, whether you realize it or not, programming your children. They are going to be, to a certain degree, some more than others, greatly affected by your behavior. Not just by your words, but how you carry and conduct your life. And the question that you have to ask yourself is this. Do my children, as they get older, are they going to be praising God for what they saw in my life? Or are they going to be moving further and further away from God because of how you failed in this transformation? Understand something. The problem is never the Word of God. The Word of God is power. It has not just the potential, but the anointing to bring about holiness in our life. It talks about as a double-edged sword that cuts away everything that needs to be removed. So what's left of that which God can bless, He can mature, and He can grow? So be aware you are indeed being watched. And your greatest concern is this, that my speech my deeds, everything that makes me me might be used to bring glory to Him. That the people might see that living, that resurrected Messiah by means of the Holy Spirit ruling my life and bringing about such a transformation that others will want that same truth, that same gospel, that same power, that resurrection power to be in in their life. Let me share with you, we have a great potential. When when God speaks about this kingdom and preparing the world for the kingdom, you know what he's coming to do? When Messiah comes, he's coming again to bring judgment, meaning those who are going to be in the kingdom or those who are the recipients of judgment, it's going to be dependent upon Messiah's work through who? Through his people. We're his body. We are the ones that Messiah is using in order to carry out his purposes and his work. The gospel is a gospel of power when we submit to it, having received it by faith, and utilizing the power of God's grace. Well, we're out of time. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.